Hello and welcome back to the YOLO series. This is going to be our last video for our series and it's going to be about YOLO V7. In this uh, video we're going to talk about what YOLO V7 is and why it's important. Since it's the last video and it has a lot of important concepts, the video is going to take around an hour. So buckle up your seat belts, and I hope you stick around till the end of the video. And I'll make sure that I will cover all of the important concepts mentioned in the Yellow V7 paper. But before we move on, make sure to subscribe to my channel and ring that notification bell so you never miss another episode. First, let's start by talking about what is YOLO V7. YOLO V7 is the fastest and most accurate real-time object detection model for computer vision tasks. The official YOLO V7 paper named YOLO V7 Trainable Bag of Freebies uh, set the new state-of-the-art for real-time object detectors was released in July 2022. The title was really long for a paper, uh, but they want to mention that it was the new state-of-the-art model at the time of its release. Yellow V7 was actually, the paper was released before Yellow V6, but now Yellow V6 is considered to be the state-of-the-art model because its performance was better than the Yellow V7 model. Next, let's start uh, to talk about the authors of the Yellow V7 paper. The Yellow V7 model was authored by Wong Kinyu and Alexei Bukowski. You are already familiar with these names as we have already mentioned them in the previous Yellow models. Alexei AB took up the Yellow torch from the original author, Joseph Redman, when Redman quit the computer vision industry due to ethical concerns. One can you entered the CV research state with cross-stage partial networks, or CSP networks, which allowed the Yolo V4 and Yolo V5 to build more efficient backbones. From there, one can you steamrolled ahead, making a large contribution to the Yolo family of research with scaled Yolo V4. After that, one can you released the Yolo R model, which we have already covered in a previous video. Uh, which introduced uh, new methods of tracking implicit knowledge in tandem with explicit knowledge in neural networks. Finally, the two authors uh, came together and collabed to release the Yellow V7 model. Next, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about what makes the Yellow V7 different from the previous Yellow models. The Yellow V7 authors so to set the state of the art in object detection by creating a network architecture that would predict bounding boxes more accurately than its peers at similar inference speeds. So what's new in YOLO V7? So there are two major modifications that they have made. The first one is in architectural reforms. They have made some major updates on the architecture of the model. The second is in the trainable bag of freebies, uh, which are a set of parameters or techniques which are implemented uh, during the training stage. For the architectural reforms, the first major implementation was the introduction of the EELAN or the Extended Efficient Layer Aggregation Network. The second one was model scaling for contamination-based models. Under the train trainable bag of freebies umbrella, we have the planned reparameterized convolution and course for auxiliary and fine for lead loss. So uh, before we start talking about the major reforms that were made on the v 7 model, First, we have to get a grasp of two major important concepts that are mentioned over and over again in the Yolo V7 paper. 
since there are many complex things presented in the yellow v7 paper uh, before we delve into the, com the complex parts let's first clarify these two points the first one is model reparameterization the idea behind uh, model reparameterization is that it merges multiple computational modules into one at the inference stage this gives us better inference time so model uh, reparameterization is just a method of merging multiple computational modules or convolutions into one at the inference stage so that during the inference time we get a better result than the training uh, time the model reparameterization techniques are divided into two main categories the first one is model level ensemble and the second one is module level ensemble the former is to train multiple identical models with different training data and then average the weights of multiple trained models so if we have already came up with a model then we can uh, train the model multiple times by changing different parameters or we can uh, train multiple models and then average the weights to come up with the uh, final model uh, that's about the model level ensemble and the second one which is module level ensemble the latter is to perform a weighted average of the weights of models at different iteration numbers so we take a weighted average of the weights of the models during different iteration numbers which means uh, during uh, different epochs when we train the models in recent years module level reparameterization has gained a lot of traction also some of the reparameterization techniques are not architecture agnostic which means uh, they are not relying upon the architecture meaning they can be used only with some architectures so since they do not uh, since most of them are not architecture agnostic they can only be implemented with certain types of architectures that means you cannot just train different models uh, and use the reparameterization technique it is it can only be applied to certain types of architectures and YOLO v7 introduces a new kind of reparameterization that take care of the previous methods drawback. The second most uh, important concept that's mentioned on the YOLO v7 paper is model scaling. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the term model scaling. Uh, model scaling is a way to scale up or down an already designed model and make it fit any computing device uh, this gives the designed architecture great uh, flexibility so if, if we have uh, a base model then if we want that model to fit into different kinds of computational devices then we can either scale up or down that model uh, in order to fit our computational device so the former is to train multiple identical models with different training data and then average the weights of multiple trained models so when we do the model scaling the first one that we can do is uh, we can train multiple identical models with different training data and then average the weights of the multiple trained models and there are different types of scaling like resolution scaling, depth scaling, width scaling, and stage scaling. Uh, we, we have already seen these concepts when we talked about the efficient net paper which was introduced by Google in which they scaled up a model by using different parameters and they they use different types of scaling techniques to scale up the resolution which means the width and height of the image the depths which means the number of layers the width which means the number of channels and finally the stage 
uh, which means the number of feature pyramids. Model scaling basically gives us the trade-off between speed and accuracy. Now that we have already covered the two most important concepts, then it's going to be easier to uh, to elaborate on the model architecture and the trainable bug of freebies that we have mentioned previously at the start of the video. So one modification that they made uh, was on the model architecture. And the first one is the extended efficient layer aggregation network. The EELAN is the computational block in the yellow V7 backbone. It's the major computational block uh, which means most of the convolutions in the backbone use uh, this, this type of uh, computation. It takes inspiration from previous research on network efficiency. So in simple terms, the ELAN architecture enables the framework to learn better. It is based on the ELAN computational block and at the time of writing this post, the ELAN paper has not been published. So ELAN is just a method of computation. It's, it's just a computational block and uh, it doesn't have a paper for now, but they used this type of uh, computational block and then modified it by extending this computational block and introducing uh, different types of techniques uh, so that it could improve uh, the result for the Yolo V7 model. So before they arrived uh, at the EELAN computational block, uh, let's see the evolution of efficient architectures. Let's see how the computational blocks evolved from uh, the previous ones up to the current one, which was deployed in Yolo V7. The design of an efficient architecture primarily focuses on the number of parameters, amount of computations, and computational density of the model. So for example, if, you, if we want to design an efficient architecture for our model, which is going to be deployed on different computational devices, we have to take into account the number of parameters of the model, the amount of computations that are going to be implemented, and finally, the computational density of the model. The Vavnet model uh, goes a bit further and analyzes the influence of the input-output channel ratio and the number of branches of the architecture and the element-wise operation on the network inference speed. So we have already uh, talked about the Vavnet in a previous video. And it actually uh, took into consideration of the input and output channel ratio from different layers and the number of branches from the architecture and the element-wise operation on the network's inference speed. So in order to scale up or scale down a model, uh, one thing that might be affected is the number of uh, computations, the number of branches that are executed. Uh, for example, if when we use a CSP structure or a residual structure, there are going to be many branches to our model. And when we scale the number of layers, there is going to be a difference between the input and output channel ratio. So if we want our model to be efficient, we want to preserve the number of parameters in the original model. So we have to come up with a way that preserves the original input-output channel ratio and the number of branches of the architecture uh, without costing us too much in terms of computation. The subsequent prominent development in the architecture search is called ELAN and Yolo V7 extends that and calls it EELAN. And the conclusions drawn from the ELAN paper were that by controlling the, short, the shortest, longest gradient path a deeper network can learn and converge effectively. So from the previous ELAN paper, uh, the, the one thing that they analyzed was how to use the shortest and longest gradient path 
uh, in order to come up with a deeper network that can learn and converge effectively and much faster. So let's see how EELAM does its job in the Yolo V7 paper. The EELAM strategy is to use group convolution to expand the channel and cardinality of the computational blocks. So the original VOVNet uh, uses, this is the original number of channels, which is indicated by C. Then we originally send, we send the, the original number of channels directly, and then we perform a bunch of convolutions, and then finally we group them, and now the number of channels will be for C instead of C. And we do that again and again so we have a different number of branches and uh, we combine the, com the the output from these convolutions to the original number of channel and we concatenate them together using group convolution the second one was a, mod a modification to the vov net known as csp vov net in this case, well, we introduce the concept of cross-stage partial networks, so we divide the original number of channels into two, and we take the partial part of the number of channels and uh, perform convolutions and also send the original one. Uh, and also we, uh, we send the, the first one directly to the bottom. Then after concatenating them here, then we can perform the convolutions again and then finally we uh, concatenate them together with the original one so this is just introducing the csp concept to the original VOV net and then finally we have the new elon uh, which is based on the csp VOV net and here uh, instead of concatenating them together here, as uh, we can see from the CSP VOV net, uh, we, we can stack the computational blocks on top of one another uh, by skipping the concatenation stage. And then finally, after stacking them together, then we can send the output directly downwards. And then finally, we have the two convolutions here. And this was the original ELAN. So it applies the same group parameter and channel multiplier to all the computational blocks of a computational layer. Then the feature map calculated by each computational, computational block is shuffled into G groups according to the state group parameter G and then concatenated together. So the new uh, EELAN uh, uses uh, three types of cardinalities which is the expand, shuffle, and merge cardinality. They also use the stack uh, computational blocks, uh, which was originally introduced in the Elan paper. And then finally, they shuffle and also merge these you know, channels together here in order to form the new Elan. So the parameter G just in indicates the groups uh, in which we're going to the set of groups for the group convolution. And if you want more detail about uh, how group convolution works, you can read the papers in detail as mentioned on the paper so that you get a better grasp of how group convolutions work and how we can shuffle these groups uh, to form the final number of channels. At this time, the number of channels in each group of feature maps will be the same as the number of channels in the original architecture. So in order to make our model efficient, we have to preserve the original number of channels. So no matter how many branches that we introduce or how many computational blocks uh, we're going to add, uh, finally, we need to have the same number of parameters as the original one. So that's uh, what the EELAN is supposed to do on the backbone of the network. 
So the number of channels in each group of the feature maps will always be the same as the number of channels in the original architecture. Finally, we add the G groups of uh, feature maps to perform merge cardinality. In addition to maintaining the ELAN original design, ELAN can also guide different groups of computational blocks to learn more diverse features. So by using the merge and the shuffle cardinalities, the ELAN can guide the different groups of computational blocks to learn more diversified features than the original ELAN and the VOV needs. So regardless of the gradient path length and the stacking number of computational blocks in the large scale ELAN, it will reach a stable state. So for example, even if we stack a large number of computational blocks or we follow different uh, kinds of gradient paths or branches, uh, after a while that ELAN structure is going to reach its final stable state and no matter what we do, it's not going to increase the performance of the model. So that means if more computational blocks are stacked unlimitedly, this stable state may be destroyed and the parameter utilization rate will decrease. So if we pass this threshold of the stable state for the computational blocks and then add more computational blocks, that stable state will be destroyed and instead of increasing the performance or in, uh, decreasing the number of parameters so that our model can be efficient, that parameter uh, utilization rate will decrease. So what EELAN does is by using expand shuffle and merge cardinality to achieve the ability to continuously enhance the learning ability of the network without destroying the original gradient path. So by preserving the original gradient path, which was established by ELAN, it uses the expand shuffle and merge cardinality to, in order to achieve the ability to continuously add, add upon or enhance the learning ability of the network without destroying the, the original gradient path. So this efficient method uh, will always preserve the the gradient path and also the, num the number of parameters. So EELAN only changes the architecture in the computational block while the architecture of the transition layer is entirely unchanged. So we, they introduced the EELAN only on the computational blocks of the backbone of the yellow B7 model. And during the transition layers, we do not introduce this type of uh, computational block onto our model. Now we have finished the EELAN method and the second one, uh, the second method that they introduced is how to scale models for concatenation based models. And the primary purpose of model scaling is to adjust some attributes of the model and generate models of different scales to meet the needs of different inference speeds. So the purpose of model scaling is just by adjusting some attributes or parameters of the model, we can generate different models at different scales that meet, that meet the needs of different types of inference speeds. In Google's famous architecture called EfficientNet, they scale between the width, the depth, and the resolution, as we have mentioned previously. Uh, but later on, researchers tried to see the effect of vanilla convolution and group convolution on the amount of parameter and computation when performing scaling. So they, used, they tried to observe the effect of the normal vanilla convolution and the group convolution on the amount of parameters that the model has in the computations when they perform the scaling strategy. One method that they deployed was known as the Network Architecture Search, or it could be known as NAS as an acronym. 
uh, which is a commonly used model scaling method. And it is used by researchers to iterate through the parameters to find the best scaling factors. So when they scale the models, they use the parameters to scale the uh, different uh, the different parameters of the model, such as uh, the width, the height, the width, the depth, and the resolution. So in order to come up with the best scaling factors, they used a method known as the network architecture search to come up with the best to, uh, with the best ones. But however, methods like NAS do parameter-specific scaling, and the scaling factors are independent in this case. So they just only come up with specific number of parameters for the scaling purpose, and the scaling factors are independent from each other, which means the scaling factors that we come up uh, with for the width, the depth, and the resolutions are going to be independent of one another, and they do not depend upon each other for the scaling task. So what are the problems with EfficientNet scaling method? The strategy used by EfficientNet is not suitable for concatenation-based architecture. The Yolo V7 model, as we have uh, mentioned previously, is a concatenation-based architecture, which means it relies upon concatenation for merging and combining uh, the different channels coming from different layers. So if we want to scale up this type of model, we cannot implement the, the method deployed in the efficient net architecture. So when scaling up or scaling down is performed on the depth, the in degree of a translation layer, which is immediately after the concatenation-based computational block, will decrease or increase. So as, you can, as we can see from the figure below, there is a concatenation-based model on the first image. And when we scale up the depth, the depth of the network, uh, which is adding number of layers, the width of the model will also be changed. Uh, the second one indicates a scaled-up concatenation-based model. So it's going to, uh, it will cause a ratio change which is between the input channel and output channel of a transition layer. So in order to avoid this problem, uh, this, they have to come up with a new method on the Yolo V7 model, when they scale up the Yolo V7 model to fit the requirement of different computational devices. When the depth factor of a computational block is scaled, the proposed method should also calculate the change of the output channel of that block, then perform width factor scaling with the same amount of change on the transition layers, and the result is shown in the below figure. So uh, here, as we can see, we you know, for, uh, first we can scale up the width of the network, and we send the partial directly here. And the partial part uh, during the computational block, uh, we can scale up the depths, and during the transition, we can scale up the width, and then finally merge these two together. And finally, during the transition layer, uh, we mer uh, we perform scaling up the scaling up of the weights. So whenever we are scaling up the depth factor for the computational block, the proposed method should also calculate the change of the output channel of that block. Then we perform a width factor scaling with the same amount of change on the transition layer. So width factor is always performed on the transition layer and depth scaling is performed on the computational block. And this preserves the, the ratio change between the input channel and the output channel so that we are not going to end up uh, with different number of channels when we scale up the width and height, uh, the width and depth. Now we have finished the first part of the model, uh, the model architecture. 
and uh, second uh, we're going to talk about the trainable bug of freebies uh, which are which were which are a set of techniques uh, that are deployed during the training stage for the yellow v7 model so the first one is a planned reparameterized convolution so uh, before we start talking about the planned reparameterized convolution implemented in yellow v7 uh, let's first define the term what is reparameterized convolution or repcon. Reparameterization is a technique used after training to improve the model. It increases the training time but improves but improves the inference result. So this is a technique which is used in deep learning uh, after the training stage. So after we're done training the model, if we want to improve the performance of the model, it might increase the training time but improves the inference results. So there are two types of reparameterization used to finalize models. The first one is model level reparameterization and the second one is module level ensemble. Now let's see the difference between model level and module level reparameterization. We have uh, touched it a little on the previous section, but now uh, we're going to say it in detail and as it applies to the, the YOLO v7 model. Model level reparameterization can be done uh, in two ways. The first one is using different training data but the same settings to train multiple models, then average their weights to obtain the final model. So we can use different training data under the same settings to train multiple models, then we just average the weights to obtain the final model. Second, we take the average of the weights of the model at different epochs. So we have already mentioned in the previous slide uh, we can take the average of the weights on every iteration or at every epoch as, as we go uh, further during the training stage. Or we can just uh, train the different models using different training data under the same settings, then finally average the weights to obtain the final model. This is called model level reparameterization. The second one is module level reparameterization. Recently, module level uh, reparameterization has gained a lot of traction in research instead of the model level. In this method, the model training process is split into multiple modules. Uh, the outputs are assembled to, the, to obtain the final model. The authors of YOLO v7 paper show the best possible ways to perform a module level in sample. So the one that is implemented in the YOLO v7 paper is known as a module level reparameterization. Now uh, let's see uh, what reparameterized convolution means uh, now that we have already covered the concept of reparameterization. Repconv is just a type of convolution and uh, we have already mentioned this as you can uh, if you can remember from the v 6 video we have talked about the rep vgg model which was used as a backbone for the v 6 model so repconv is similar to what we see in resonate but apart from one identity connection it also has one more connection with one by one filter in between. So as you can see from the image on the right, we have a ResNet model, a conventional ResNet model. So on the residual connections, we just have, we just only have one by one convolution. And on this one, we just preserve the original, uh, the original uh, feature map. And then on the other paths, we just perform two C by C convolutions. On the second one, we have a rep VGG, which uses double uh, residual connections. So on the first one, we just have a one by one filter. And on the second one, we don't perform any one by one convolutions. 
So this is the structure of the convolution during training stage, but during inference time, in order to reduce the computational cost, we just remove the residual connection and compress them into just three by three convolutions when we make inference for the model. So now that we have covered the concept of RIPCOMB, uh, let's see how RIPCOMB is deployed in the Yolo V7 model. Yolo V7 researchers used the gradient flow propagation paths to analyze how re-parameterized convolution should be combined with the different networks. So as we can see in the diagram, the 3x3 three three normal convolutions can be used for just a simple computational block of a plane network. Then the three by three convolutions of this, uh, the ELAN, which will be the ELAN computational block that we have already mentioned previously, we're going to replace those three by three convolutions by the new RepCon, which is a reparameterized convolution layer. And then we get the reparameterized plane net. Uh, this is just a normal ResNet, and this is a reparameterized ResNet since it has. A residual connection. So for direct connections that don't have residual connections, we use a plane name. And they didn't use this one, so they crossed out uh, D. And here we have, uh, we just replaced the first one by webcom, and for the second one, we just use a normal convolution, uh, which is a P1 rep resnet. And then by trying different alternatives, then finally they, uh, they used B, C, G, and H for the final Yolo V7 model. So experiments, the experiments they carried out by switching or replacing the positions of the RepConv, 3 by 3 conv and identity connection can be shown on the figure. And the residual bypass arrow shown above is an identity connection. And it is nothing but a one by one convolutional layer. So just remember that there is a one by one filter for the residual connections. Including RepConv, Yolo V7 also performs reparameterization on the conv BN, which is a convolutional batch normalization and online convolutional reparameterization or REPA. And Yolo R to get the best results. So out of the eight combinations which were which are shown from the figure, uh, four work out great. So they are marked they are marked with a green tick in the below image. Now we have finished uh, covering the first cleanable bag of freebies, which is uh, which was the reparameterized convolutions. The second concept that they introduced was the course for auxiliary and fine for lead loss. So uh, we have already talked about what auxiliary and lead head means because it was already deployed uh, starting from the other X model. So in order to understand how we branch out the head part of the model into two different stages is by using what's known as a deep supervision. So deep supervision is a technique that is often used in training deep networks. And it is a central concept uh, which adds an extra auxiliary head in the middle layers of the network and the shallow network weights with assistant loss as the guide. So it is a method in which we introduce auxiliary heads in the uh, middle part of the model before we reach the uh, final layer. So previously we just only had the head part of the model, but now we introduce the head in the middle part of the model uh, and we call it an auxiliary head, uh, which will be introduced in the shallow part of the network. And this helps, this actually helps the model to learn uh, much faster. 
uh, because we can propagate uh, what the model has learned from the auxiliary head and learn extra uh, things when we reach the final layer. Even for architectures such as ResNet and DenseNet, which usually converge well, deep supervision can still significantly improve the model's performance on many tasks. Uh, when uh, I think it's on the inception paper, they they also use auxiliary heads in the middle part of the model or in the shadow part of the network. But uh, for ResNet and DenseNet, I don't think they have one. So if we introduce the concept of auxiliary head for these networks, we can significantly improve the model's performance on many tests. As you already know by now, YOLO architecture comprises a backbone, a neck, and a head, and the head contains the predicted outputs, and YOLO v7 does not limit itself to a single head. It has multiple heads to do whatever it wants. It is interesting. So in YOLO v7, the head is responsible for the final output, uh, is called the lead head. So the the head which is found on the final layer of the YOLO v7 model is known as the lead head. And the head used to assist training in the middle layers is called the auxiliary head. So now uh, we have defined the differences between the lead head and the auxiliary head. Now that we have established the differences between auxiliary and lead head, uh, with the help of an assistant loss, the weights of the auxiliary heads are updated. Uh, we, we use another assistant loss uh, in order to train the auxiliary heads. And it allows for deep supervision and the model learns better. These concepts are closely coupled with the lead head and the label assigner. So the concepts that we have mentioned for the auxiliary and lead heads can be combined or coupled with a label assigner, uh, which, one, which we are going to define on the next slide. Now that we have discussed the differences between lead head and auxiliary head, the second thing uh, we need to define is uh, soft and hard labels. In the past, the, in the training of deep network, Label assignment usually refers directly to the ground truths and generates hard labels according to the given rules. So in the previous the deep learning literature, we already used hard labels and it's very easy to understand what hard labels are because the label assignment strategy usually refers directly to the ground truths to generate the hard labels according to specified rules. However, in recent years, if we take object detection as an example, researchers often use the quality and distribution of prediction outputs by the network and then consider together with the ground truths to use some calculation and optimization methods to generate a reliable soft label. So mostly in object detection networks, instead of using just hard labels, they use a combination of soft and hard labels uh, in order to optimize the, the performance of the model. So they want to generate reliable soft labels for their model. But here is a question, how to assign a soft label to the auxiliary head and lead head of the model? Uh, we, we know how hard labels work because this is just the ground truths for the intended objects. But in order to assign a soft label to the final prediction heads, uh, we need to use what is known as a label assigner. So what is a label assigner? A label assigner is a mechanism that considers the network prediction results together with the ground truths and assigns soft labels. Before, we were not using the predictions from the model to assist the learning of 
the model. Then now, once we get the prediction results from the model, we combine them together with the ground truths to come up uh, with what's known as a soft label. So label assigner is just a mechanism that assigns the prediction results together with the ground truths and assign a soft label. It is important to note that the label assigner generates soft and coarse labels instead of generating hard labels. So it's reliant upon the soft and coarse labels instead of just using hard labels. In the YOLO v7 model, there are two types of label assigners that were implemented. The first one is the lead head guided label assigner. And the second one is the course to find lead head guided label assigner. And both of them are depicted in the figure below. The first one, as we can see here, is a lead guided assigner. Uh, this is the lead head and the auxiliary head that we have mentioned previously. And the label assigner works by assigning the soft labels to the lead and auxiliary heads, as we can see here. So first, let's see the lead head guided label assigner. The lead head guided label assigner encapsulates the following three concepts. The first one is the lead head, the second one is the auxiliary head, and the third one is the soft label assigner. The lead head in the YOLO v7 network predicts the final results and soft labels are generated based on uh, these, these final results. And as we can see, we have the lead head and the auxiliary head depicted for the lead guided assigner. And it, uh, the lead head will just predict the final results from the model. And the soft labels are generated based on these final results. So the, the soft labels will be generated and then they will be used to guide the loss for the auxiliary head. The important part is that the loss is calculated for both the lead head and the auxiliary head based on the same soft labels that are generated. So these two losses for the lead and auxiliary head are uh, trained by using the same soft labels that are generated by the label assigner. This is the ground truth, this is the label assigner, and then we have the soft labels which are used to guide the losses for the lead and auxiliary head. Ultimately, both heads get trained using the soft labels, and this is shown in the right image. One may ask here, why soft labels? The authors of Yellow V7 put it quite well in the paper. The reason to do this is that the lead head has a relatively strong learning cap capability. So the soft label generated from it should be more representative of the distribution and correlation between the source data and the target. By letting the shallower auxiliary head directly learn the information that the lead head has learned, the lead head will be more able to focus on learning residual information that, ha that has not yet been learned. So there is a lot of concept being crammed into this paragraph but what it's saying is that the purpose of the lead head is to have a relatively strong learning capability. So those are the reasons that we define soft labels is to enable the lead head to have a relatively strong learning capability. So we use the soft label generated from the model and it should be more representative of the distribution and the correlation between the source data and the target. And by letting the shallower auxiliary head, which is located in the shallow parts of the network, directly learn the information that the lead head has learned, because they can just learn by themselves in the shallow uh, part of the network, and by using the label assigner, we assign some of the soft labels coming from the lead head directly to the auxiliary head and they get an advantage of learning directly the information that's coming from the lead head. And the lead head will 
we'll be able will be able to focus on just learning the remaining or residual information that is left uh, from the auxiliary head. So as you can see, it's a very good strategy because the lead head could, could just focus on learning the remaining or the residual information that is left behind from training the auxiliary head. The second one is the course to find lead head guided label assigner. Now coming to the course to find labels as shown in the right image, actually the two different sets of uh, soft labels are generated. So the first one is a find label to train the lead head. And this is the find that we can see uh, that, uh, that is used here on the image and a set of course labels to train the auxiliary head. So the fine label is used to train the lead head and the course label is used to train the auxiliary head. The fine labels are the same as the directly generated soft labels. So these fine labels are just the soft labels that are assigned by the label assigner. However, to generate the course labels, more grids are treated as positive targets. This is done by relaxing the constraints of the positive sample assignment process. So in order to generate the course labels, what we can do is to treat the more grids or outputs from the model as positive targets. And we can do this by making the constraints of the model more flexible and relaxing them so that the positive samples can be assigned more than the negative samples. Then finally, we have the course to find a lead guided assigner. So the name seems complicated, but when you break it down, it's just a combination of course and find label in order to guide the lead and auxiliary heads. The below figure shows the object detector architecture without and with deep supervision. So by combining all of the concepts that we have mentioned up to now, we can revise uh, the head part of the model again. The first one is just a normal model uh, without having a lead and auxiliary head. We just have the final detection head from the model here. For the second one, we implement the auxiliary head on the shallow part of the network before we go to the lead head. So this is a model with just a lead head and auxiliary head. Besides establishing the lead and auxiliary head, we have uh, talked about an independent label signer, uh, which guides the lead and auxiliary heads loss by creating soft labels and here, the first one was the lead guided assigner, and the second one was the course defined lead guided assigner. So, the figure five just compares the normal model, the, the second one, with the, uh, which has the lead and auxiliary heads, and the last ones are the ones that we just uh, previously defined. And the proposed legal assigner is optimized by lead head prediction and the ground truths to get the label soft training lead head and auxiliary head at the same time. And the detailed course defined implementation method and constraint design details will be elaborated in the appendix of the paper. So uh, now we have finished discussing all of the complicated concepts from the yellow V7 paper, and now we just define the differences between the basic YOLO v V7 versions. YOLO V7 is a basic model that is optimized for ordinary GPU computing. So if you want to implement YOLO V7 on an ordinary GPU, uh, you can just use the yellow v7 mo model directly from the repo. The yellow v7 tiny is a basic model optimized for edge GPU. For edge computing devices, you can use the tiny version of the model because it's much smaller. 
with relatively good performance. The next one is the Yellow V7W6, which is a basic model optimized for cloud GPU computing. For cloud GPUs, you can use the W6 version. And other variations include the Yellow V7X, which is the extra, extra large version, the Yellow V7E6 and D6, which were obtained by applying the proposed combine, combine, compound scaling method that we have uh, discussed in the previous slide. Finally, uh, let's uh, finalize or conclude the discussion about Yellow V7 by uh, mentioning the results. It is already established that the Yellow V7 has the highest frame per second in mean average precision in the range of uh, 5 FPS to 160 FPS. As you can see, these are the different versions of models that we just mentioned, and these are the parameters, the number of parameters, and here we can see the number of parameters increase as we go down, as we start from the tiny version to the E6E version. This is the frames per second and finally the average precision performance. So the performance of the model increases as we go down and the number of parameters also increases, but the number of frames per second uh, goes down because the other V7 tiny version is much faster compared to the large version. Finally, when we see the chart for the experiment results, all the v 7 models surpass the previous object detectors in speed and accuracy in the range of 5 frames per second to 160 frames per second. As you can see, they did not include the v 6 uh, model uh, to compare the v 7 model with it. So we cannot say that the v 7 model is a state-of-the-art model because uh, we haven't compared it with Yellow V6, but the Yellow V6 paper actually compared it with the Yellow V7 paper. And if you want more detail about the Yellow V6 uh, paper, you can watch the video about Yellow V6. But up to now, Yellow V6 is a established state of the art object detection model. Here, Yellow V7 is compared with models like Yellow R, PP Yellow E, Yellow X, Scale Yellow V4, and Yellow V5. And the purple one indicates the Yellow V7 model. As we go up, the performance of the model gets better because the average precision is higher. And as we go from right to left, it's, it gets better uh, because the inference time is much smaller in milliseconds. And so the Yellow V7 models, as you can see, are uh, located to the top left uh, part of the chart, which means it's better and faster than other models. So when we see the mean average uh, precision comparison, Yellow V7 versus the other models, the following table shows the, compar the comparison of Yellow V7 model with other baseline object detectors such as the Yellow V4. And when we make the, comp the comparison, we have to take into account with the size of the model. So we use the baseline model Yellow V7 is compared with the baseline model of Yellow V4 and Yellow R. And the extra large version is compared with the extra large version of the Yellow R model, which was the best at the time of uh, the release of the Yellow V7 model. And the tiny version is compared against the tiny version of Yellow V4. And here is also the E6 and the D6 versions. And here the positive ones indicate the gains and the negative ones indicate the losses. So we have finished talking about all of the models in the yellow family. So I want to say congratulations for completing this lesson and uh, I hope that you have learned something new uh, in the series. Uh, from the start of the series up to now, we have covered the evolution of the YOLO model. Uh, we have covered the important concepts mentioned in the literature. 
So I hope that you can continue to learn about uh, more object detection models uh, so that you get a better grasp of how the YOLO model compares with other object detection models. So I want to finalize by saying uh, thank you for watching the entire series. And if you have any comments, uh, you can comment them directly below. So I want to say uh, thank you for uh, staying up to the end of the series. And I hope that you can uh, implement the things that you have learned from this tutorial onto your projects.